Our show is now on Stitcher. Listen to us on your iPhone, Android phone, Kindle Fire, and other devices with Stitcher. Stitcher is smart radio for your phone. Find it in your app store or on Stitcher.com. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. Pray with me, if you will. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come with the fire and burn. Come with the rain and cleanse. Come with the wind and breathe. Come with the light and reveal. Convict us, convert us, consecrate us. Claim and call us with your care and concern, O God, until we do something. Amen. Amen. Scholars tell us that this lesson includes one of many I Am speeches delivered by Jesus in the fourth gospel. The I Am portion of each of these formulas, I am the good shepherd, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the true vine, along with others, these make a play on the well-known I Am formula from the Hebrew scriptures, the divinely stated personal name of God. Recall that in Exodus 3, when Moses asked God who he should tell the Israelites sent him, God answered, I am. The fourth gospel meditates frequently on God's name, regularly coupling it with ideas, words, images, or metaphors that give expression to who Jesus Christ is as the Son of God. The verses of our lesson build off the assumption of Jesus Jesus's divinity uh, to articulate the nature of his relationship both to God as the creator and to humanity as the lost children of God who Jesus came to reconcile in the name of love. The thought of this passage uh, is somewhat abstract. The work of mediation in reconciliation is affected in the very person of Jesus himself. Not abstract. On the one hand, he relates to God, and on the other, he relates to humanity, and as he is related to one and the other, they are indeed related to each other. In this relationship, through Jesus' Jesus's care, uh, God's care for humanity, and we, are, we know um, Jesus deals with the human condition. Humans experience God's care in both positive and negative dimensions. For as God works in relation to humanity through Jesus, good is nurtured while evil is eliminated. The text has several important truths. First, Jesus as the living Lord is a source of whatever good our lives yield in his name to the glory of God. Second, we are called to be gracious, to, be, to the gracious experience of investing our lives in Jesus. As we give our lives to him and live towards his teaching, we are promised that our lives will generate results that are in keeping with the will and purpose of God. Coupled with this promise is a negative word, and that negative word is simply that fruitless discipleship guarantees condemnation. Third, in terms of the metaphor of the vine, we are told that unproductive branches will be trimmed and burned. Exactly what this means is not as explicit as we'd like, we, though there are a couple of turns of phrase. Uh, indeed, the threat of being burned is the backside of the promise of fruitfulness for those who are productively invested in Jesus. At some level, we may conclude that God works among us in and through Jesus with the expectation that there will be real discernible results in our lives and in the community of faith in which we live. The text calls us forward to a life invested in the way Jesus lived, a fruitful existence indeed. There's a story of a fellow who had been reared in a city and bought a farm and several milk cows in the feed store one day, he complained that his cow had gone dry. Aren't you feeding her right? Asked the store owner. I'm feeding her what you're selling me, said the man. Are you milking her every day? Just about, he said. 
If I need six or eight ounces of milk for breakfast, I go out and get it. If I don't need any, I don't get it. I just let her save it up. By now, I know some of you know something about uh, milk, uh, and, and that isn't how it works. The feed store owner had to explain, it just doesn't work that way. With cow's milk, like God's presence, you take all that's there, or you eventually, you uh, have nothing. Asking God for God's power in six-ounce doses or asking sporadically, only at our convenience, may mean for us the source dries up. Uh, this um, uh, illustration is from Don Aycock, Aycock uh, writing for Louisiana Leadership uh, in November of 2007. There was a story uh, in the news a few years ago, and we're still talking about this regularly, but I remember this because it, it uh, related to me fairly accurately. Um, it was about a fourth grade teacher teaching her students about sustainable farming. And we know that this has become somewhat avant-garde. Some people have practiced it their entire lives. Um, she began with the simple question, did they know where broccoli came from? A boy raised his hand and said, that's easy, it comes from Ralph's. Now, some of us, that probably is true. Uh, I didn't know what broccoli looked like on a branch until I saw this thing that looked like a, a tree in uh, Trader Joe's a while back. The truth is we tend to think less about how our food gets to the table than about how much it costs. Folks, my name may be McDonald, but I know very little about farming, gardening, what I've learned is by listening to my wife and my sons talk and work on their North Hills property, which is just under 35,000 uh, square foot lot. I'm told that this is known as a, a city acre, and I, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I know it's, it's, a, big, it's a big lot. And I, I get the, the, the planting and the pruning and the, the nurturing and fertilizing, whatever, whatever you do to, to uh, get the things to, to grow. Even the burning of the waste I get. When my parents moved to uh, Central Orange County in the mid-50s, um, believe it or not, we had an incinerator. I don't know whether you know what that is, but there was this thing in the back of most every home. We didn't have it because my parents bought the, uh, the model home, and just before we moved in, the city ordinances uh, did away with incinerators. This means that the trash wasn't regularly picked up. You took it to uh, the, the dump or waste site, and uh, you burned everything you could in that incinerator. So I, I get that uh, at some level. What I will never understand or have a high level of appreciation for is uh, weeding. It's a tedious kind of evil task. I just don't like it, and no amount of uh, coaxing uh, will get me to enjoy it. I do it occasionally, but that's why I have a gardener. If we are true followers, vines, we must be fruitful, says Jesus. To be fruitful means an intentional attitude towards living in a way, in the way and will of God. It's another story of, it has two farmers who uh, had farms that bordered each other. Things always seem to go just right for Farmer Bill. Whenever he sold a load of corn, the market prices were up that day. He would increase his wheat planting the season that other parts of the country uh, had, that produced wheats were, wheat were having a drought. And so his yield got top price. Farmer Bar, Bob, on the other hand, never seemed to have things go right. The day he would sell a load of rye, the rye prices would be down. The year he decided not to plant so soybeans was the year that Brazil had a terrible soybean crop. And so the prices were up. One day Bob was out in his field and he noticed that Bill was working in his field next door. Bob called to Bill and they began to have a conversation over the fence. I've been noticing, Bill, that you always seem to know when to do exactly the right thing. When you sell a crop, the prices are up that day. When you buy, you buy things when prices are down. For me, things go just the opposite. When I decide not to grow beans, beans go up that year. When I sell grain, the price is always down. Bill, what is your secret? 
There's no secret, Bill replied. Every morning, the first thing I do when I get up is I open my Bible at random, close my eyes, and point to a verse. And then I open my eyes, and whatever that verse tells me, that's what I do that day. Why don't you try it? I will, Bob said. The next morning, when he got up, Farmer Bob took out his Bible, opened a page at random, closed his eyes, pointed to a verse. He opened his eyes, and his finger was pointing at, you guessed it, chapter 11. It'll come to you. It'll come to you on the way home. <laughs> the problem is, this is a wonderful quote from D. Hawk. If you don't know who he is, I'm going to give you a little bit about that. The problem is never how to get new innovative thoughts into your minds, but how to get the old ones out. Every mind is a building filled with archaic furniture. Think about that. Every mind is a building filled with archaic furniture. You must get the old furniture out of what you know. Think and believe, and you must get it out and before you can get anything new in. Make an empty space in any corner of your mind and creativity instantly will fill it. it the, the quote is attributed to D. Hawk, cited by uh, M. Mitchell Waldrop. Uh, and in DHOC on management uh, with, from the, the Fast Company website, which is also a, um, a magazine periodical. It's dated um, uh, November of 1996 and was retrieved November of uh, 2014. DHOC was the founder of the Visa Credit Card Network. In 1984, he resigned from his post as CEO and left the business world behind, spending the next 10 years working a 200 acre plot of land west of California's Silicon Valley. Now I know it's easy to say when you're a billionaire you can become a farmer because you've got money to burn, so to speak. But the question is, uh, how did he get that attitude? He was born in 1929. Uh, as far as I know, he's still in robust health. Um, here's a few thoughts he had. And this has, I think, everything to do with what it means to bear fruit as a human being, if not a person of faith. An organization, no matter how well designed, is only as good as the people who live and work in it. Only as good as the people who live and work in it. On leadership, he, he says, if you look to lead, invest at least 40% of your time managing yourself, your ethics, character, and principles, purpose, motivation, and conduct. Invest at least 30% managing those with authority over you. Think of that. And 15% managing your peers. On money, and remember, this is a really wealthy dude. Money motivates neither the best people nor the best in people. It can move the body and influence the mind, but it cannot touch the heart or move the spirit. That is reserved for belief principle, and morality. And this is, has to do with conduct, obviously. Make a careful list of all you've, the things you've done that you ab abhorred, meaning those things that you feel bad about, and then don't do them to others, ever. So all of this is to say, what do you want to grow in your life? What do you want to happen in this community? What do you want to see in this world? What needs pruning? What needs tossed out? What needs a little nourishment? If not fertilizer, because remember John Thompson, Dr. John, uh, who invented Super Thrive, never, when somebody called it fertilizer, he would get downright our rate because it was hormones and vitamins which helped things to grow. So what, what additives do you need to your life, to your heart, to your mind and body and soul, which will enable you and this wonderful place we're called to serve, to bear fruit? Amen. Beloved, we move now to a time of sharing in the sacrament of communion. I would remind you that in the United Methodist tradition, neither myself nor this congregation are host. Christ alone is host here, therefore all are welcome.
to partake in the sacrament of Holy Communion. You have an insert in your bulletin, and if I haven't said this recently, forgive the repeat for some of you. Uh, The reason I like this uh, great thanksgiving is I know the people who wrote it. They are colleagues, two of them now retired, and one serving at Claremont. That would be Mark Wiley. Um, And we did this in worship several years ago at uh, Redlands uh, for annual conference, and it just touched me. And I I overused it for years, and now I've broken back, and uh, and I I use it quarterly. So bear with me and read, and hopefully I'll do it in complete sentences. (laughs) The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We We lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. O God, you created the universe with a shout of joy, a word of delight, and a big bang. You made gravity holes and antimatter, swirling electrons and dancing quarks, shooting stars and sapphire blue planets. You filled the ocean with clownfish and sharks, with dolphins and killer whales. You filled the air with doves and hawks, songbirds and hummingbirds. You covered the land with shimmering aspen, towering redwoods, weathered pine. You blessed all the creatures of the earth the bugs, the snakes, the lizards, the lions, tigers and bears, the puppies and penguins. You blessed all the children of earth, each shape and size, every color and complexion, every makeup and mood, every style and substance. But we, oh God, preferred to go our own way. We messed things up. We wanted to be in charge. We wanted to be in control. We thought everything belonged to us. We polluted the environment. We destroyed each other. We turn sacred ground into battlefields, schoolyards into minefields, hospitals into death camps, and children into killers. But God, you never gave up on us. You never walked away or walked out. You always honored your promises, even when we broke ours. You always welcomed us home with open arms and a warm heart, even when our fists were clenched and our minds closed. When we walk through sorrow and chaos, you are with us. When we live through moments of war and acts of terror, you walk with us. When our homes are destroyed, you help us build new homes and finally lead us home to you. And so with your people on earth and with all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Ever and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the right time, in the fullness of time, in the nick of time, at high time, you sent your Son to bring us back to life. He opened a window into your new creation, graced us with grace upon grace. He showed us a vision of your way for us. When every child has enough to eat and can sleep safely all through the night, where every graveyard is a front porch of heaven, where the untouchable and unlovable are given seats of honor, where tears of mourning become tears of laughter, where Grievous wrongs and horrid sufferings are made right and fair, where children hunt Easter eggs on playgrounds made from battlefields, and where everyone is welcomed in love. In the dead ends of our lives, Jesus clears a way ahead. In the dead spots of our relationships, Jesus speaks words of hope and renewal. In the dead zones of our cities, Jesus calls forth a new kingdom. When we are dead tired, Jesus picks us up and carries us to a place of rest. When we are dead wrong, Jesus confronts us with the truth. When we are dead last, Jesus tells us that he is one for us to eternal life. And so, on the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, 
gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my love shared for you, the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ Christ is risen, Christ Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and fruit of the grape. Make them be for us the love of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed through his love. Renew Renew our our communion communion with all your saints. saints. Since Since you have refreshed our souls from the waters of life, help help us refresh and renew renew others. Since Since you have given us strength for the journey, help help us to strengthen others on their journey. Send your spirit to renew our faith and transform our souls so that we we may hear your music, work for justice, delight in heavenly food, Strengthen one another in love and grace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Beloved, in a few minutes at the direction of the ushers, you will be asked to come forward and kneel and and receive first the the bread and then the cup. Uh, If uh, kneeling is of some difficulty, please feel free to sit in the front pews. Uh, If getting to the front pew is of difficulty, alert the ushers, and we would be honored to serve you wherever you are. Come, let us celebrate God's grace. we do have a a gluten-free option for the bread.
Pray with me if you will. God, we thank you for your boundless love, for the strength of your, of your grace, and for the leading of your spirit. May these creatures of grape and grain strengthen us spiritually to the end that we might be more bold and loving in the way we live our life towards you. Amen. Thank you for listening to the First United Methodist Church podcast, which is recorded live every week at 4832 Tahunga Avenue in North Hollywood, California, and delivered by Dr. Joey McDonald. For more info on us, please check out nohofumc.com or find us on Facebook and Twitter under nohofumc. Thank you.